life insurance. And then under the 692, they need to do the board's amount of pickup a payroll item. And we have a um, right here, um, it shows that when they calculate it, $1.44 um, for the one that we're um, in our procedure here, um, it's a total of $2.94. But again, you only want to enter $1.47 when it's full board pickup um, because the system knows that it has to take $1.47 and put it to the employer pickup and it has to do $1.47 to the Medicare for the employee side. So the system knows what to do in that situation. So they so you don't want to add that total amount of 294 because then it's going to double 294. So just a reminder on that. Okay. We'll go back. Okay. So the next thing we want to do is the adoption assistance. Um, again, for the classic people, um, that's an NC2 that used to be. Um, now, if they um, be sure to make sure that they do the adoption under core adjustments um, or um, they do it in future or payroll. So if they um, still have that before the year end, um, they can go ahead and enter in that in that last pay and put that total amount that they did for the employee once they get that amount. No. Sorry, my cat wants to join us. No, sorry. Okay. Reimbursal employee expense. Um, the process is uh, the reimbursal employee. That would be your NC3 payment in classic. And then we have the reimbursable employee expense. And here we have a scenarios um, of all the different ones that the districts can go through. I won't go through all of them because there's a lot, but we have seven of them. And we have them listed here, so it's easy to find um, if they were paid through USAS, through the warrant check, or if they were paid through payroll, and if they want them to show on box 14 as a fringe or not in box 14. Um, again, we have all these different scenarios that they can pick and choose from, and we have um, each one shows what options they have then. And it, it has um, a direct breakdown of what exactly they need to do in core adjustments. Um, if they have non-cash amounts for W-2 reporting, we even have that down here. Um, if it was used prior to the last payroll um, calendar year, um, then we have um, what you need to do for that for scenario one. If it was not used and if they want it to show on box 13 or not box 14 for the fringe benefit, we have that breakdown here also. And I won't go through each step because we got it pretty much detailed out and it tells exactly what um, how it will show on the W-2. But we do have those scenarios out there. <clears throat> the next thing is, oh, got to go one more. There we go. Um, the next thing you want to do is make sure your OSDI W-2 abbreviations are all um, updated and correct. Uh, again, these should be all correct already, but again, the districts might want to check to make sure if they don't have an employee, new employee that came in with a new school district, um, they want to make sure those are filtered or correct, or correct. So what you can do is go to payroll item configuration, go to type equal OSDI, and that should bring up all your OSDI um, payroll items for configurations. Um, again, they can go in and check to make sure that they have their W-2 abbreviation is entered and their OSDI code is entered incorrectly. And they probably wanna do that for each one. Okay. Um, again, we have um, codes here. If you click there, it takes you directly to the OSDI school districts. And then this is for tax year for 2023. And then it shows you exactly what the code should be and then what the rate or percent is. So they wanna double check to make sure they have those correct. The next thing is the city W-2 abbreviation. Again, do the same thing as you did for OSDI. Type in city. And you can go to each payroll item 
and make sure that the W-2 abbreviation is correct on each. And then the other thing is you wanna make sure, um, I put a little note in here I just added about the Indiana, um, cause they are a little different because they do for their county tax for those ITCs that have um, um, districts that have employees from Indiana, you wanna make sure that payroll item configuration city tax is set up um, for that county tax. And the other thing that they wanna make sure is that they have a payee entered as, mm -hmm, where's my Indiana right here. They wanna make sure they have the tax entity, W-2 abbreviation. And then also they wanna make sure they have that Indiana in the payee address, because when we create that file, that's what it's looking for those employees with that um, Indiana payee um, state. So we wanna make sure that they have that set up. So I added that in there just so um, they don't forget. And then the other thing they wanna make sure um, after the payroll item configuration is correct, they want to make sure that those employees that have it under payroll item, and I have an Indiana employee here. Here we go. And you want to make sure that they have that deduction type set as residents. And they also want to make sure in this code one that they have that code set up. And again, I have um, appendix, which is located right here. And it tells what Indiana County codes that they will need, need to in, input for that employee. So whatever county they live in, make sure that um, those two digits are entered in correctly for that employee here. So that's just another thing to double check. Okay. The next thing is the city um, tax entity code, which, we, which I had mentioned before. Um, they just wanna make sure um, double check um, all the city to make sure that they have, there it goes, it's a little slow this morning, to make sure they have this tax entity code correctly inputted for each of their cities. Okay. Um, if they do have questions on that, they can ask their uh, file with, um, call their city on that if they don't know it. The next thing would be for your RITA and CCA. So those cities that um, um, pay through RITA or CCA, you just wanna make sure that they have that RITA set up here at the bottom and the RITA description. And again, for CCA, they wanna make sure they have the CCA code filled in, CCA description, and make sure they um, check the report to CCA. All very important. Okay, and also we have the tax tables here for you um, that if they have questions on there, we have those sites here right here for us so they can go in. Um, the other thing for Rita um, on the payroll item for each employee uh, that has that city tax, they wanna make sure that they have that set correctly to either employment or residence. So they gotta make sure they have that filled in also. Um, for the CCA, um, they are a little different than Rita, a little bit more picky. Um, they want to make sure um, that the addresses are all filled in correctly um, so that we have the, um, the site here for them that includes what code they need to use so they can find their city and then use that CCA code that needs to be entered on that screen here, right here. So we included that in there. So they might have to do a little research if they haven't done this, but they just wanna make sure that that is correct before they move on. Okay. So same thing as Rita and CCA needs to make sure that this um, and their payroll item for those employees that have this CCA city tax, that they have this employment or residence filled in. They want to make sure they don't miss that because this is something that they do look at. And then also CCA, like I said, they um, are pretty strict on their USP Postal Service um, on the addresses. So we did include that publication here for you 
and you can go ahead and make sure that in the employee screen that they have their addresses set up correctly because they want them a certain way um, in the abbreviations. So they want to make sure that they have that set up correctly. Um, probably for employees for last year, if they didn't have a change of address, they probably are set up correct if they didn't um, flag a warning last year in CCA. Um, but any new employees, um, they're going to want to check to make sure that they have that address set up correctly in the employee screen before they move on. Okay. We will move on to the other state. Um, this one, they just want to verify if they have any other states like the Kentucky, Indiana, Pennsylvania, Michigan, those surrounding ones that have employees. Um, they want to make sure in the payroll item configuration that they do have um, that state ID entered in correctly. Again, if they have questions on where to find that state ID, they can contact the state and they can get that um, state ID. But I'm sure they probably already have that inputted from last year, unless they have new employees this year. The next thing is um, you want to verify that your HSA is set up correctly. Um, again, payroll item configuration. You want to go to your HSA records. You can type in health. And it'll pull up um, all your HSA um, employees. And I have one here. And you want to make sure that they have it. You can make sure your abbreviation of how you want it. And make sure that annuity type is set to other for those HSAs. <clears throat> because when it's set to HSA, it will be coded in box 12 as a W. <laughs> the next thing they want to confirm is... Um, is the districts, um, between you and your districts, you guys will decide who's going to print and, and maybe some districts are not up to that to printing yet. Um, so it's up to something that you need to discuss with your districts, who's going to print the W-2s this year. Um, and, in, and in that case, if they are going to print, they need to go to system configuration, or you at the ITC, go to W-2. And right here we have, the option to for districts to print their own W-2 files. So you want to make sure that is checked. And then the new option we have here that we had a request was for, um, since they're sending them out in the mail, some of these districts, they don't want the whole social security number in case somebody gets a hold of it. So we added that option now that the last four digit will only appear on the W-2 um, forms and the XML when they print them. So I think that's going to be nice for um, probably all districts are probably going to want that. So that way nobody gets a hold of that social security number. They want to make sure the company information is all entered in. They want to make sure the contact information is correct. And again, the submitter information. Now, this comes from when they um, register with the um, SSA BSO, and that's the info, uh, what the ID they will get, and then the submitter user ID. So whoever is submitting that information, they will want to enter that um, information in here. And again, if uh, the submitter name and address is the same, then they can go ahead and click that. If not, they can enter in a different submitter name and address if need be, but it should be the same. Okay, pretty self-explanatory on that one. The next thing is the month end closing. Um, I'm not going to go in detail on the month end closing because this is something your districts do every um, month and nothing has changed. But again, we included the checklist here so they don't forget to do the month end um, closing. And again, we have it right here under checklist, but we have the link so you can just click on it and it takes you directly to that month end checklist. Hey, Andrea, can I interrupt yes. you for one second? Sure. This is Vicki from The Omen. Hey. So... Hi. So if we are going to submit the W-2s on behalf of the district, but we're printing them, but we're not using the accountability software, we're just going to print them in the PDF format. Okay. Would they? Would we click that box at the top that the district's going to submit their own? I don't know so what's going to generate that PDF that we can print for them. 
So you're going into their system and printing it for them? Yes. Okay, then in that in that case, yes. If you're going into their live like files and you're printing them for them, like it would be like just like the district printing them, but you guys are doing it on your side, then yes. yes. We'll check that box. Yes, because then that knows that the they're printing um the files for them. Now if okay. Are you are they submitting their own file no. to and everyone? No. Is no. Okay. No, we're submitting, we're submit, we're doing we're doing everything for them. We're printing them and we're submitting them, but we just, we did not do the accountability software this year because um, we felt that we could use the PDF mm -hmm. format of the W-2. So if we check that box, does yes. that trigger that PDF then Correct. to generate? Correct. Correct. Okay. Correct. But then we'll just put all of our information in that bottom section like we've done in the past. As correct, the submitter. Correct, correct. Okay. And I am going, because I'm only going through the top part of our checklist today. And then next Friday, I'm going to be going over starting of processing of W-2 and what you do if districts are printing their own and if ITCs are printing their printing them for them and submitting. Okay. So I will be going, I wanted to mention, I should have mentioned that prior. Um, so I'll be going through half today and then next Friday, we're going to go in detail more of if districts are doing their own and if uh, ITCs are doing it all for them. Okay. And that will be all next right. Friday at nine o'clock. Okay. Thank you. So, you're welcome. Um, let's see. Uh, we have a question. Do we need to worry about clearing the COVID fields anymore? We took that off of our checklist because we felt that it's been three years and we didn't know if anybody was still using those um, for, um, fields. So yes, if you want to add that um, checklist back in for your districts, you are more than welcome to, to do that. So that would, that will be fine. We decided just to take it off since it's been three years and we didn't, weren't sure if anybody was still using them. But again, you can add that back in the checklist or just remind your districts if they do have them to make sure they clear them from last year. Okay, um, all good questions, thank you. Okay, so we're gonna move on to quarter and closing. Um, again, I'm not gonna go through this um, process because the districts do this every three months and nothing has changed on that process of um, closing the quarter. Again, we have our check um, box or the here where you could take you directly over to the quarter and checklist, which again, you can find under checklist and they can file that list to close. Okay, so we'll go down past quarter. Okay, so one other thing um, before um, I move on to Pat, um, the, the W-2 processing. So once, um, if their districts are starting now, like in November and going through that first part of that checklist, just to make sure if they have time to get it all situated and now they're getting ready to do their W-2 processing, we wanted to add a double checklist again. So this is kind of, this, some of the same stuff that I went over in the first part, because we didn't want them to skip over that first part and then go directly to processing. And then they completely forget that they forgot to check this stuff. So again, this is up to you guys. If you guys want to take this off the checklist for your, for your districts, it's up to you. But we just thought it was, um, it would be a good idea to always have a double check um, for districts. So they just don't skip over things. Um, so again, um, it's just a repeat of what I had before on some of these first ones, your OSDIW2 abbreviations, your city, and then make sure your city entity code and RITA and CCA. Um, again, HSA and the W2 configuration. So again, um, you want to make sure that uh, that information is correct. So um, now to 29. So this is um, was a, a new part. So dependent care. Um, if they were not using that dependent care payroll to item type during the year, then they're going to have to add this amount under core adjustments and then select the dependent care. And they put that full amount in for the year. Um, they want to make sure they add the full amount. So if they have 7,000 for that dependent care, they want to make sure they enter that 7,000 because of, um, the system knows that anything over five is what's going to be added onto that box 10. 
So make sure it's the full amount. Um, if they did do the dependent care during the normal payroll process, then they don't need to do anything for the, um, for the um, and year end. Third-party sick pay. Your districts will probably start getting their third-party sick pay information here shortly. Um, so hopefully they can get that in soon. Um, again, we have our documentation, third-party sick pay. And we have a breakdown of exactly if it's non-taxable and if it's taxable of the steps that you will need to do under core adjustments to get that information in so it gets printed on the W-2 for that employee. Okay. Um, for that sick pay, um, again, once they get that all set up, that will be in box 12 and code J. The next one is the life insurance. Um, if they did not use the life insurance before that last pay of December for their employees, then they're going to have to do a few steps, um, not too much. Um, if they go under core and adjustment, they want to enter um, drop down of 001 federal, choose the life insurance premium, and then they want to enter that amount that they figured for that employee for the year in there. Okay. And then um, that will be added to the total and equitable gross of federal, state, OSDI, city. Again, you have to look on the city payroll item configuration to see if their uh, non cash earnings is checked and then Medicare. So that gets, so no manual adjustments need to be made otherwise than what this 001 is. But the other thing they will need to do, because um, if they run uh, W2 now, they're gonna get a Medicare warning um, because they added the total and Apple gross to the Medicare, but there no adjustment was made to the amount withheld. So again, they will have to figure out and who's gonna pay for it, either ask the employee for their portion or the board pays for their employee and board portion up to the district. And then they wanna choose the amount withheld and enter that amount in. And then again, they wanna repeat for the board's amount of payroll item for the board side if they, um, so that way those two match. And then the other thing is if your, your employees um, are full board pay pickup, then again, they need to do that total adjustment of uh, the 1.45% to the board pickup amount of the payroll item. Again, you only wanna do the one amount because it knows that it has to double it for the Medicare on the W-2 and the employee Medicare pickup on the employee. And again, um, we have that um, all out here on our, uh, if I can find it. I don't wanna lose my thought here. There we go page. Let me get to payroll. <laughs> My screen light drops down once I click on it. Okay, here we go. And I just wanted to show you, um, if because if you do have questions on like kind of what those adjustments are affecting, we have them under core adjustments and you can see right here. And if you click on each one, it'll take you directly to um, exactly what it does. So it gives it the breakdown. So I just wanted to show that, that we do have that out there um, broke down on each one. Okay. The next thing is the fringe benefits. Um, again, you will go to core adjustments select the employee, select the 001 federal. You wanna select the fringe benefits and then enter the amount of that fringe benefit for that employee. And once that is done, it'll go in box 14 as a code, as a code fringe. And then the moving expense, um, these are only for military employees. So I'm not sure how many districts have that again, but uh, so many probably don't have to worry about this, but if they do, they will go to core adjustments, choose the dropdown of 001, 001 federal, 
go to the moving expense and then enter that total amount. And then that will go in box 12 with a code P. The company vehicle, um, if you have districts that um, have vehicles for their employees, then they would go to core adjustments, 001 federal, and then uh, choose the vehicle lease and the total amount of the vehicle lease. And then this will also go in box 14. The next thing is if they have adoption assistance, um, that would be the NC2. So if they didn't um, have that during the year um, through current or future, then they would need to make sure that they go to adjustments and, and um, 001 and make sure they choose the adoption assistance here for that total amount. And then when they do that, um, they will go ahead and um, that would be in box 12 and it would be quoted as a T. The next thing is taxable benefits. Um, if the non-cash taxable, if that was not used during payroll through um, future or current, then they're gonna have to do um, some adjustments. And what this will do is with they go to the core adjustments and add that under 001 as taxable benefit, um, this will update the total and Apple gross of the federal and state records automatically. Um, if it was ran through payroll through future, there is nothing that they need to do. It's all It will be correctly coded on um, their W-2 then. And again, we included that link here for reimbursed employee expenses um, and has all the scenarios that they want that we went through last time. Okay. Where are we? Right here. So the next thing is the employer health ah, coverage costs. There we go. Um, again, this is, would be the total of their health insurance for employee and employer. Now, again, um, these should be um, being counted through the year if you have the payroll item configuration set up correctly for these um, employees. So if you go to there, you will see employer health coverage. As long as this box is checked, the system knows um, to add that in. So they want to make sure that they have those boxes checked for um, before they process W-2. Um, if they didn't, then they can go into adjustments, select the 001 federal, select the type of health insurance, and then add that amount that they need added on to. So they don't want to add the whole total amount again, because then it will just double what they had paid previously through payroll or something, and then um, it will double on. So you just want to um, put the amount that you need to either fix or add on to. So just a reminder. Now, if your district doesn't um, keep track of this during the year um, of the maybe the board portion, um, they can do, using mass load, do um, adjustment journal, and they can add these employees in that way, and that way that amount will get on their W-2. We included the link here for the mass load, and they want to use the adjustment journal. Takes me to different places here. And then here they would need to include the employee number, payroll item code, the amount, transaction date, and then health insurance as their type. So they want to make sure that they um, get that amount figured in there um, before that they start running W-2s. Then once they get that all in, this will go on box 12 with a code of DD. Um, the next one would be the health reimbursement arrangement. Um, again, this would be for districts that have less than 50 time um, full-time employees, um, which is 130 hours a month or 30 or more hours a week for consecutive 120 days. So again, you have to check with your districts. I'm not sure how many that would be. Um, and they do not offer a health plan. So maybe this does not relate to anybody in Ohio with their districts, but just in case we do have this out there, they would want to um, go to core adjustments, go to federal, 
oh, a one payroll item, and then select that type of health reimbursement. And then that total amount um, that they need to report. And then what that would do when you print your W-2s, that will be on box 12 with a code FF. Okay. So again, I'm gonna start the W-2 report and submission um, next Friday, we're going to go through more details if the district does the printing or the ITC does the printing and what needs to be done. Um, we thought, you know, break it down to make sure um, there's not so much information all in once. So is there any questions um, that need to um, go over that we were missing that you wanted to go over now? Um, and just a reminder, um, what I'm doing next Friday and then in February 9th, Lori Nye is going to be going over the W2C, which is the new um, W2C corrections. Um, we're going to be going over that on February 9th. Um, so that way you can go ahead and um, learn how to print, reprint everything on that. So we thought in February, um, we'll be probably starting to get questions on the the W2C corrections. Okay. Um, is there any other questions? Um, I see Brenda. Is there any instructions on balancing? Yes. If you go to W2C ITC calendar year end, and we have the effects uh, reimburse effects of W2 situations. Um, if you're having, um, this will show you what affects uh, the W-2. Um, we have them outlined here in red that affects the balancing between the W-2 report and submissions and the quarter report. And what each one um, could affect. Any other questions on, okay. The process are going to, the Medicare adjustments posted. Tuition, let me look here. I have to you, I, she had a question on tuition. And what the tuition would be, uh, would be a French benefit. Um, you would enter that in the adjustment as a fringe, and then anything above the fifty-two fifty is considered um, taxable. So you would enter anything above that fifty-two fifty as a fringe benefit. That was a good question. Thank you. Any other questions on W-2 processing to get ready for the year? Okay, we'll go ahead and send it over to Pat. You wanna take like a five minute break? Oh yeah, that'd be great. Okay, we'll come back at 9.45. Okay, thanks Pat. Yep. All right. Good morning, everybody. I'll be reviewing the USAS uh, calendar year end procedures. <clears throat> Please ask questions if you have them. And like Andrea said, I think she provided the link, but make sure you start have the wiki link that starts with MCOECN. The other one I think started with SSDT, but we are no longer updating like the documentation under there. So you want to make sure you're on the right page. So where are you registered under meetings and trainings? And then normally you would go here to register and the recaps are below. Right in the middle of the page is the calendar year end meeting materials. So we click on there. At the top, we have the agenda for today. 
Um, and like Andrea said, her links and supporting documentation is on the right and accounting for USAS is on the left. So included here is the PowerPoint that will be going by, which follows the USAS calendar year and closing checklist. But again, keep in mind, this is like a generic uh, checklist and procedure. And we want the ITC to customize it for their districts because there's a lot of like variables that um, could be different from one ITC to another, for instance, who submits uh, for their districts and who which districts submit themselves. So tweak the checklist and or PowerPoint to your needs and, but we've provided like a general uh, guideline here. And then the rest of the links that you see um, are from the IRS. For instance, the general instructions for certain returns and then more specific for the 1099s miscellaneous and the 1099 um, non-employment compensation form. Notice it has the revised of uh, still for last year, but it is, they just haven't updated it. So keep an eye on that if they do, but so far they have not. And then the uh, good resource that I find is the publication, IRS publication 1220. So there's the link for the tax year of 2023, as well as the link for the IRS link for whoever's submitting for their for forms. They have to log into there to submit the forms to the IRS. And then some information on the TCC, which is the transmitter control code. So we just put it here to have it like all in one spot to be accessible for you. We're gonna start with the PowerPoint. And we'll, re we'll be reviewing, um, I think I jumped a slide. The steps that you can, the districts can do now to prepare for their 1099 printing and submission, as well as like the month end procedures, as well as uh, the calendar year end procedures, which includes the processing and submitting of the 1099s. We'll also, I'll also show the difference between whether the district submits versus what the ITC should do in the ITC management application. And that's where the ITC would combine their district files. And we'll, there was a Fridays with Fisco last year, but we'll review in summary how that works. And again, these are ge general procedures that you can tweak. First, oops, I wanna start to know your forms and due dates. Like the 1099 NEC stands for non-employment compensation, and that's usually for independent contractors. Those should be filed to the recipient or to your vendors by January 31st, 2024. Um, but they should be submitted to, they should also be submitted to the IRS by January 31st, 2024. The 1099 miscellaneous are used to report things like rents, royalties, and royalties are like for patents or copyrights. Um, there's another type for medical and health care payments and then gross proceeds paid to an attorney. So that form has to be submitted by March 31st, 2024 but the form has to go to the vendor or the recipient by January 31st. So those are the deadlines, but um, if it was me, I would just make sure everything was done by January 31st so that you could just be done with it. But this form can be submitted late or later. 
And some of those due dates are either on that, um, those links provided on that main page from the IRS, or here's a, a link that I also provided. And I mentioned attorneys and attorneys are kind of tricky, but from what I've read in the IRS book, they gave an example. Attorneys are normally, um, their service fees are normally reported on the NEC for non-employment compensation. However, on the miscellaneous form, there's that box for gross proceeds paid to an attorney. And the example that I found was from the IRS that said gross proceeds are payments made to the attorney in the course of doing business, but it's not for the attorney's services, but instead payments for like in a settlement agreement. I've never seen it reported on a um, form, but I'm sure there it's out there to, and it's out there in USAS to use and utilize. Um, you can also remind districts that if they plan on submitting files to the IRS themselves, then they must have that five digit TCC number or that transmitter control number. And that number is required in order to log into the IRS system to submit the forms. And what it does, the TCC number identifies the username at the business or school who is submitting the electronic files. I say school or ITC, depending on who submits. It's the, it's like a username, but it's a TCC code. And if the submitter of the forms, of the 1099 forms do not have the TCC number yet, then I provided the link for the application for it. And then the, let me click on this, the fire system update will give you, I think it was this link. No, it's not. I was thinking I was going to click on the, um, the processing, like when their window is open for districts or ITCs to submit because, of course, they have annual updates and for a time period, um, the system will be down so they can upgrade their system. But for more information on that, there's that link as well. Um, that test or first time filers must file like a test file before their actual first submission. And this is only for the program for the combined federal state reporting program. And what that is, is essentially um, it's approved so that the federal IRS will forward the state forms to the appropriate states. Um, there's more information on that. And then, oh, here's the fire system availability. I knew I had a the link. I'll click on that. And you can see that the processing for 1099s you probably won't have done until January 8th anyway, but you can't submit until January 8th because they're down for annual updates. And then for your test files, it's also there as well. And they say to wait 45 days or to allow 45 days for you to have for the submitter who applied for this to have 45 days to get back your TCC number. And once you do, you'll receive like a approval letter or email from the IRS. And you do need that before you, the submitter can log in and submit. You'll get that approval letter or email from the IRS. And the test file can be created in USAS application. So, and we'll go into the application, but one of the choices would be the submission type and you would choose the test and whether or not you're approved for the combined federal state filing program. And then you would uh, generate and it would give you a test file to submit and test. 
one thing I do want to note, and I'll point this out when we get into the payment year, when you're going to the menu option for 1099, 1099 extracts will not show 2023 until the posting period of December exists. So you have to open December, but you can close it. It just has to exist on the uh, posting period grid. So things you can do now would be to like verify your vendors, your vendor addresses, which in the system, in the USAS system, it's the 1099 location. You'll want to verify the vendor's social security number or EIN number, as well as the tax type, whether they should have the SSN or the EIN number. And then there's various types of 1099s that you'll want to verify, including ones that don't receive a form, and those would be the non-1099s. Those that do receive are flagged to receive a 1099 would have a type of non-employee compensation and that would go on the NEC form. And then the other five would go on the 1099 miscellaneous. But in USAS, you would flag the vendor with one of those types. So prior to year end, you can verify that information um, so you're ready to go at the end of December. <clears throat> One thing I do want to note, this is a totally um, optional program that the IRS offers. And um, it, what it does, it's an interactive, immediate result tool that they, the districts can use. And I believe you enter the name and the number that you get off that you get from your vendor, whether it's a social security number or the um, employer identification number, the EIN. So the IRS tool would match and tell you whether the name matches a social security number, for instance. So I've given you um, the link for more information on that. Again, it's immediate verification. I've actually seen it used like in the accounts payable office, but at the time where they're setting up the new vendor. So the accounts payable office would receive the vendor's 1099, or sorry, would receive the vendor's W-9 with the vendor's information. And prior to sending, setting it up in the USAS application, they would use this optional tool just to verify the information before before setting up the vendor incorrectly. But again, it's optional. I don't know how many people use it, but I thought I'd mention the tool. And I added this slide late last night. I thought it would be uh, good to know as an option. There's a configuration under system configuration menu that's called vendor tax ID number configuration. And sorry, this is included in the PowerPoint when you click on that calendar year end. I just wanted to let you know that if you printed this out prior to last night, this slide was missing. But this is optional and the district can configure this to allow like a validation when entering a new vendor. So this is you would go under system configuration and then find that vendor tax ID number configuration option and click on it. And it opens up to this. And your options are either no warning, um, require an error message for all vendors that you need that tax ID number entered, or you can require and throw an error if no tax ID number is entered for just 1099 vendors, all types, but all 1099 vendors, or you can set the same options up for a warning. And I actually have an example of those, and that just comes from the manual. So 
there's your options that I just showed you. And this would be the error messages for the first two. Tax ID is required for all vendors or it's required for just 1099 vendors and same with the warning. Um, it's the no warning that is the default. So I thought that's why I would mention it. If they say the district had a whole bunch that they had to fix before December 31st or whenever they process, then maybe they could select an option here to help them out. Oops. Okay. So in the U USAS application, let's review how the vendors look and what you can do. So this is on, well, let's go into a vendor, into the application. And under core vendors is where, where you find your vendor records. And I am going to go in just to a particular one, Douglasville Cafe. All right, so when you're setting up, you have the primary name. but And then the system calculates the amounts. This is where the taxable total would pull from when you're processing the 1099s, normally the year-to-date total would match, but not necessarily. Um, but right below that is the 1099 section. So the 1099 section includes this option to ignore limits or not. Um, I don't know of an example, a real life example, but this would be for if the district wanted for sure to report a vendor that only had $200. So it doesn't meet that $600 threshold to actually print a 1099, but by ignoring the limits, you would be able to pull that vendor in. Again, I'm not sure the a real life example why you would do that, but the option is there. Um, and this is one of the things that we're verifying, whether it's a social security number or an employer identification number. And then you want to make sure you get the right number. That way I don't get your taxable income on my social security number. And then this is the type of 1099s, um, including those that don't get any, which is the non-1099. And then you'll have the NEC and your miscellaneous types. All right, so then... You have the new hire and down below is your locations and this or I don't know if it's normally but you have to have a primary and you, over here you have the choice to choose the to use this address and name for the purchase order the check or the 1099. In this case we have a separate vendor name and address with a check mark for 10, 1099 so what this is set up to do is just to use this record for 1099s and this record for POs and checks. And you can see they're different. I'm assuming this one's going to the cafe and this one's going to his home. Um, but the 1099, since he's an independent contractor, I'm assuming, by his type, and then his social security number entered up there and then just by the name as the clues that I see. So you want to verify not only the addresses and this information, oops, the 1099 information. So I had a PowerPoint slide that how do you, um, how do you, verify all these things. And there's several options. The vendor's grid, um, by using filters and advanced queries, you can print a template report called the 1099 vendor report. 
or you can, this is the actual menu option that prints the 1099s and submits, but you could use that report to verify as well. These are all, these all can be like used interchangeably or at different times of the year. So for example, the vendors grid can be used for a quick reference. You're setting up vendors or you're looking for something and you verify it just by a glance or a filter or the advanced query, which I'll show you in a moment. Or you can run or the district can run the SSDT 1099 vendor report, like say throughout the year, just to keep up on things that might need to be edited or fixed. All right, so let's talk about each one of these and I'll give you examples. Let's go into the um, the vendor's grid. I'm gonna reset the grid so I can show you what I pull into the grid. So this is the standard reset grid, not much information, but with the more button, you can pull in more information. There's a 1099 section that if you click on that carrot, you can pull in these options into columns on your grid, which is what we're trying to verify the types, whether it's NEC or the other miscellaneous types or the tax ID type or the ID number. We can pull it on the grid and then look. You can even, if you choose to, pull in the default 1099 location this would just give you that check mark where whether it's the default 1099 address, you would actually have to pull in these fields for the address, the name, and the phone. Again, this would just be that check mark that says to use that address for the 1099. So I think, yep, I got all the fields that I want. It's going to, as soon as I close that box, it's going to reconfigure the grid. Now, many people have lots of vendors. So sometimes as you go to, let's try searching for like a uh, non-employee compensation and I might get like a, a excessive error. Of course not when I want to show you. <laughs> but if you do get that excessive error, It'll warn you that you have, it just can't, it needs to be filtered down more. So what you can do besides like choosing the types, I would first start with um, active vendors. Now you may want to also review your non-active vendors just in case they should be getting it and had year to date wages, but you can also do that on the vendor report because the vendor report will pull in both inactive and active. But we're on the grid and you can sort by or filter by true. I'm just going to move this ignore limits out of the way because I don't think I have any that are set for true. Oh, I do have a couple that are true. Uh, you can sort by all kinds of things, you know, on your grids. You can also produce a report. So let's say we want the rents 1099s. You can click that button, produce a report or generate a report. You can also save it to be utilized later. And you might wanna look under your um, template reports because you might've saved it last year. So when you generate that report, it'll be the re what's on your grid. Those columns that I chose for rents. And then you can verify it like that, for instance. Uh, also on the grid, especially if you're getting those excessive query errors, I would utilize that advanced query button. So this further filters down the grid in a more efficient way. 
and then looking for that 1099 information, or you can verify the locations. There's the tax ID, and you would pull that in. And once you set your operation equals, we'll say the rents, you would get and apply, you would get the results down here. So let's do that. Well, that didn't work. However, we'll say it worked. You can now save your query that worked with a name. You click this button and then later this month or next year, anytime you come into this grid, you have your saved queries. So we're starting from scratch. You can just go to advanced query and pull up your saved query, it populates, apply query, and there's your royalty. And you, again, can make a report if you want to. I have, this is for reviewing people who are set up not to receive a 1099, and you'll wanna verify that. And I'll show you in a minute why. systems thinking. So these are all my 1099 vendors. So I would like view this list and what would catch my eye would be this name. And again, this is an anonymized database. So if you know a Betsy Smith, this is just purely coincidental. I just made up the name because it's a common name. The Smith is. So should she, I mean, since it's an individual, should she be set up for a 1099 when she has a social security ID type and the number? And I forgot to pull in, and we'll do that. We could pull in the, the amounts year to date. I'm going to pull in the taxable total, which will be on the 1099 but I'm also gonna just out of curiosity, pull in the year to date and it's gonna wipe the grid clean. But again, that query is saved so I can go right to it. Click the advanced query. And we were looking at non 1099 vendors, apply, poof, and it's there in a moment. And when, we get to show Betsy, you can see that that vendor also has a year-to-date taxable over 600. So that's something I would investigate. That's what we're doing is verifying, does that look right? I also have the NEC vendor query set up. So again, it's just a quick look that you can also make a report and save it. So then when you go to your reports, you can also flag the ones that you'll be utilizing. Um, I skip something in my notes that I wanted to show you on the grid, but I'll show you in the query because you would do the same thing on the columns here. So I have active equals true, which we did earlier. We put T is for true. So whether you're doing it for the, in the advanced query or on the grids, this is what you would do. On the type 1099, column, you would put equals non-1099, and then the taxable total, we'll get rid of this, you could do equal or greater than or equal $600, and then, oh, there's my excessive query, if I put true, it should go away. 
because I'm filtering further down. And if it doesn't go away, that's one reason why you would use the advanced query. There we go. So these are my people or vendors that will not be receiving a 1099 that you'll want to verify. So you can do it on the grid or the advanced query was what I was trying to relay. And in both the query or the grid, you can sort by any of these. I think it's 1090D. No, I think it's royalty. Oh, it's thinking. All right. Any questions on the grid or advanced queries? Yeah, the limit for royalty is $10. Sorry, if I, I think I said 600 earlier. That was a question in the chat. Uh, let's see. All right, so the next thing I want, so we showed, I showed you about the grids and the advanced query. The other thing you can do is finding the, all right, we have another question. Shouldn't you review the non 1099s for possible royalties as well? Yeah, you're looking at all sorts of scenarios. The one I gave about like that Betsy Smith was just, um, an example of what you might find. Now you might be looking for the possible royalties too, or medical payments. Um, and all this can be reviewed before um, even preparing the forms. Now, one of the other options that you can utilize is the template report that's SSDT 1099 vendor report. And remember you can enter a tag if I view that, oops. I meant to show you the tag, so I'm gonna go back. You can tag it so that when I pull up 1099, it shows me the report. I also check marked it so it shows when I'm on the home page. So looking at this report, this is another option to the grid and uh, advanced queries. We're doing the same thing, year to date taxable total equals as of, and one of the 1099 types. And again, when you generate it, you'll want to put the $600, or if you're doing the royalties, the 10, you have, and then you can even further down put, um, royalty payments and generate the report to verify it that way. So all the information, the address, you notice these two year-to-date taxable total is the same as the year-to-date total. Those don't always have to be the same. But in this case, it is. Now you can modify these configure filters and um, so that you could pull just the types, like the royalties or the rents, um, the different types that you could put and save those reports, or you can just run it open-ended and have all types on there. And I do have an example of that. Ran it totally open. So you have the people who uh, won't receive the 1099s. We have the NEC people, vendors, and the rents, other income and royalty payments with a total. Now here you see the year to taxable total, which will be used on the 1099 forms, and for some reason, the year-to-date total is higher. You might want to investigate the reason why there as well. Just as 
like verifying. All right, so you can modify the selected properties and change your report. But the other option that I had mentioned was to actually go to the 1099 extract program, which is found under the periodic menu and the 1099 extracts. And this is because you can use this because it produces the 1099 report as well. Um, this menu is going to look different depending on whether the ITC is marked to um, submit to the IRS or if the district is marked to submit to the IRS. So in a moment, I'm gonna go into the documentation because then it'll have like side-by-side -side comparison. But first I wanna let you know that if you're only seeing 2022 and you open this up and there's just 2022 and before, it's because under core posting period, you need to open your December, you need to create your December posting period before 2023 will show. So let's go into the documentation. And you'll see like the comparison left to right. The, the right is when the district is submitting their own 1099 data to the IRS and the left is the ITC submitting. Now you notice this warning that when the district is submitting for themselves, there's gonna be another configuration set up. And I find it's bigger on my screenshot. Then I can blow it up in the wiki. So let me go. I thought so. Okay, we'll go into the, um, there's a link right there. Oh, I know what I was going to do. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was going to show you it in the live application. So we're going to assume that Sampleville Schools is going to submit their own 1099 forms, and they would need to go to the system configuration and find the IRS form 1099 submission configuration. And when they click on that, you can see the check mark that the district would need to check mark. And then these options would be pulled. The TCC code needs to be entered. And that's that code that was received from the IRS when they were approved. It's a five digit code. I'm not sure if it's in that format. I think I just entered digits. Um, because the district is submitting their own file, they're going to want to put their submission details in this configuration so that it pulls into that program when we're looking at it. And then your job parameters, whether they're approved or not for federal or state, and then your limits, your royalty 10, your 1099 other vendors are 600. So then... Where was my, we'll go back to the IRS, that view where it's side by side. Sorry for scrolling. I must have passed it. Sorry. I hope I'm not making people dizzy. Okay. That's not what I wanted.
we were going under the periodic, sorry. And then 10, 1099 extracts for that side-by-side -side configuration view. This is what I wanted to show you. So you'll have the payment year and that must be defined. I know the screenshots, um, 2021, but you need to select it so that the system knows which year-to-date taxable amounts to pull into this program. And then you'll want to define the type of return, whether it's 1099 NEC or 1099 miscellaneous. You can check one or check both. And again, when the district submits, it's the same so far. We'll review the output file types, but in general, um, we'll review these in a moment, but in general, there's an IRS format, which is the TAP file, the XML format, which is used for other programs like Edge to print. You'll have reference copies, which um, are several copies like PDF forms, reference copies like for the recipients and such as well as the 1099 copies for like the IRS and that, and the printer sealer copies that in USAS you can print. So that's just this output file type. And when we go in a system in a minute, I'll show you that drop down. As far as vendors, you can uh print just Abby signs and bring them over to the right or just leave it like it is and print them all. The output file name is pulling from the core, um, under the core menu, there's a, the organization menu option and whatever's entered into that, like Cotton Demo Schools is where it's gonna populate here. They have the, choice to exclude vendors with no tax ID. You'll enter the federal TIN number for the organization, as well as the organization's names. So the address, the zip code, and then it starts to change on who is submitting. So we got all the way down to the zip code and it's still the same. But since the, the ITC is submitting on the left here, and you're gonna combine all the district files into one, we don't need the submission details yet on this, uh, where you generate the extract and the forms. But when the district is creating their own forms and submitting, you will need to have the, the contact name, the phone number, the email, the submission type, which, that would be like the original submission type. This is a drop down. And before, when I was talking about the test file, there's an option here for the test submission type. And then a correction submission type, which you most likely might use for prior year submission, which you see over here, you don't have that. And then the limits are the same. And again, you can print the report or generate the actual uh, forms and files. But we'll go through that process in a moment. I just wanted to show you the difference between this menu option when, versus who submits. And you can print that whether, whether or not who submits they can use that report to verify their data as well. So once they verify their data, um, they may need to make some adjustments. So under core, we'll go into the particular vendor. Well, it's Leary Landscaping, click on vendor adjustments. And a, uh, here's the create, and this box pops up and you can put as uh, put in a thorough description of what's going on. For example, uh, this vendor, this is the scenario. 
this vendor had a check sent to him in 2022. He never got it, so it was reissued in 2023. So in USAS, because it was reissued in 2023, it's on 2023's records. So there's one reason why you would adjust a vendor. And in that scenario, the screenshot should have been a negative. Um, but the amount can be positive or negative. Once you click post, then that amount is going to be pulled into the year-to-date taxable total on the 1099 if the vendor is set up correctly to have a 1099. Not sure how often this is used, but it's available. So now we've verified all our data. Um, we've had several ways to do that. And we can start thinking about month-end closing. But in December, we can't really think about month-end. we got to think more of the calendar year end even though we're still going to do some of these same processes like entering, making sure we enter all the December receipts and all the December transactions, as well as uh, rec attempting to reconcile your to your bank records. And that can be done under the periodic menu. You'll also want to um, make sure your accounts are in balance with like the transactions. So one way you can do that is to run the SSDT cash summary report and take the month to date totals on that report and match it to the SSDT financial report. This ensures that, um, and they should balance, but it ensures that your transactions are in balance with the account figures. And I'll, I have an example of that. So there's the cash and here's the financial. Okay. So this is the cash summary. I'm going to scroll down. Oops. I'll just make it bigger. So this is the month to date expended for December. Actually, I think I had November because I didn't have any data in this database. But pretend this is December. And we're going to, when we're pretending we're verifying December's data and the month to date column expended should equal what's on the financial detail report. And it does because this is from the transactions and this is the accounts. So we're in balance and you can proceed with um, the next steps but we're not gonna be closing yet because basically here's a summary of what we're gonna be doing. Before we close, um, we want to um, print the 1099s and this can be done either by the district or the ITC. In USAS, the printer sealer copies will be used to generate and to print the forms. If printing using a third party software like Ed, the XML file will be used to generate and print the forms. And those are those types that I talked about. And then the 1099s will be run through the envelope sealer to seal the 1099 forms. Oops. Then we want to start thinking about submission, whether the I, submission of the 1099 files. And again, it can be done by the district or the ITC. The ITC would transfer the TAT file for all their districts into one file using this, which is at the end of this presentation in summary. And what it does is combines all the files for the districts in order to have one file to submit to the IRS using the FIRE system. Or if the district submits, then the district would use that same IRS format TAP file to submit to the IRS on the FIRE system. And then we'll be closing 
the month of December, but it also closes the year. So the monthly reports archive will be generated as well as the calendar year reports archive reports. And then once that's done, you can create the new posting period for July, uh, January. So one of the suggestions is to like run any other reports that you may want. So first you got to know what's in the monthly report bundle. And these are the reports that are automatically generated into the monthly report bundle. And they're on here, it's group like budget related reports, revenue rate related reports, receipts and such. So if you don't find a, or if you want a report that's not on here, then generate it so that you have it for year or for the end of December and year end. And some of these reports could be like the spending plan reports. I'm not sure how many districts use that, but that is not included in the report bundle automatically. So if they want that, they can generate that before closing the year and month. And they might have other reports that the district normally runs as well that they can generate. But when you close the month of December, it also closes the year. So if you're going to possibly run more calendar year end reports that you may want, again, you got to know what's in the bundle for calendar year end that's generated automatically. So these are the ones that are generated automatically. You can see the all 1099 vendors reports, as well as some of the, like the purchase order and the receipts and stuff for the calendar, calendar year. <clears throat> the district may also want to run additional reports. They're customer reports for existence that or for instance, that are not included in the calendar year end bundle. For instance, the um, there's another option called the proration utility program. If they still receive like their workers comp invoice around December, I'm not sure if they do, but it used to be like in a six month chunk and you want to apply it to your benefits accounts, this program will, in USAS, will generate a spreadsheet that is used to help calculate those prorated amounts for that expenditure. So this can be used for workers' comp, insurance, but basically it's creating the worksheet based on a wage accounts. This is the example. It's creating the worksheet based on the wage accounts defined. And then prorated and mapped to their benefit account because workers comp is a benefit. And then they can take that benefit spreadsheet and upload it into a purchase order. But we, I'm not gonna go into that right now. Amanda's gonna do a session on December 15th and go in depth with that process and show you how it works and how sleek it is to just have it and create the workers' compensation purchase order that's already been prorated to the appropriate benefit accounts, for example. And I made it easy. You can click here to register if you haven't already. So besides these reports in the calendar year-end report archive and any custom reports, your extract options are also um sorry are also going to be sent to the calendar year report archive so the xml files that are used for like edge printing will be in the report archive the irs file extract file will be also sent to the archive um so all these are sent automatically when generated. And if the district 
submits for themselves, they'll also have in their file archive the transmitter report. And then the 1099 report will in the PDF form will also be sent too. So this was again showing you the difference between the um the information on the 1099 extract menu when this is the district submitting because they're asking for more information. There's the configuration screen that I was looking for earlier. When the um, district submits themselves, they have to go to that system configuration IRS form and check mark and fill in the information. They'll enter their five digit transmitter control code and their contact information and save that. Then that's gonna be pulled into their uh, menu. To think about printing, you can print the 1099 NEC and the 1099 miscellaneous forms directly from the USAS application or using a third party software. And again, the as far as submission, either the district or the ITC can submit based on the options chosen. So besides those um, reports going to the calendar archive, if needed, those reports and files can also be regenerated after you close the period, if needed. All right, so, okay. The output file type. Again, this is for the IRS submission. This would be used for to print the 1099s and another software. The reference copies. Now, when you choose, like here, the reference copies, another drop down is going to show. And the drop downs is going to be copy one, two, A, B, and C. And I've defined them here. Copy one would be oops, for the state department. And then the copy two would be the vendor state copy. IRS copy and the recipient's IRS copy, and then the payer, which is the school district. So the reference copies are that PDF form to save, to reference later, to have a hard copy. And then the printer sealer copies, which is another option here, is the actual forms that are used for direct printing in USAS and formatted to this form only. So it's that eight and a half by 11 normal size, but it's folded in thirds or whatever they call it, the Z fold. Um, and that form contains the recipient copy two and copy B for the recipient. And this is what it's going to look like. So it folds in thirds and gets mailed out. And it's the Z fold forms, eight and a half by 11. And again, copy two is for the recipient. Copy B is next for the, also for the recipient. That's for the state, that's for the recipient. And then the it gets folded and mailed with a stamp there. That's to print and what it would look like in USAS. But if you wanted to print in Edge or another software, you, you would use the XML file format and transfer the XML file to the third party software to complete the steps in that software. But the USAS forms work perfect. So these reference copies that I talked about can also be scheduled to run all at once. So it goes into the calendar archives. So you have them. But let me show you the what I was looking under the job scheduler. When you create that job, you can see that you have 
This one's on the slide that I showed you. It has all 1099 copies, but you can also choose the four, the sealer job, copy A, B, one, two, three, and, you know, set that up. Again, this one, like on the slide, is all copies. And I have that here. And then you would just pick your cron expression from one of those cron makers. Um, so to prepare, that was to prepare like the copies for printing. Now we're thinking about submitting. So the difference with the district submitting would be the section with, we've already kind of went through the options, but you would want to pick the file format type for the IRS submission to generate the file to submit under the file, the fire application offered by the IRS. So you would take that file, you can download it from the calendar year reports archive that the district, when they close December, created, or the district can regenerate it and save it. The file name will reflect, um, remember those two check marks, you can select to create the NEC, or you can select the M, the miscellaneous form, or you can select both. So the file name will reference that. If it's just for 1099 NEC, it would be the school 1099 NEC miscellaneous. If it's just that type or both, like it's displayed here with the word both in the file name. So that's how you would distinguish the file names or the district. And then they would take that file and uh, sign into the fire IRS government site to submit the file. Similarly, they would the ITC when they're submitting for all their districts, they would use the IRS tap file too, have less options to choose from. But then, and they can download it from the district's calendar year end report archive, or they can generate it themselves. But when the district closes, the files will be there. So the ITC could just pull them from there. And again, there's the names of the the files, school name, 1099, and the type of file, NEC or both, or miscellaneous. So the ITC is going to take the file name created. And for the IT, ITC submitting on behalf of their districts, they're going to combine them in this ITC management application. And so what is this ITC management application? This is like a portal where the ITCs can take all these files and merge it into one so that they can submit these files on behalf of their districts to the IRS. The user manual I sh shared the link and it's the MCOECN link. And it'll walk you through, just like the other manuals, based on the menu options. And then last year when this was new, uh, we did a Fridays with Fiscal recording. I think it was prior to it coming out, but it's a good uh, Fridays with Fiscal recording and it can be accessed here with this link. But I was going to give you like a summary of what this, what the menu options look like. And before I do this, does anybody have questions regarding the USAS application or the procedures in the USAS application.
<clears throat> All right. So I'm going to log into the IT. I have a quick question. Sure. Um, when um, creating uh, the 1099 submission print and print files, and you choose the option to uh, the output type of printer sealer copies. Um, when that is generated, does that actually um, send a file to the archive or do you have to choose the reference? Is that the only way to send um, a file to the archive? No, when the, when you, when the district, where did I put that? When the district closes, it will send automatically. Whoops, there it is. So when the, I believe, I'm almost positive that the printer sealer copies are sent to the archive when the calendar year in December posting period is closed. Perfect. Just wanted to make sure. Thank you. Yep. All right. So I was going to log in. You guys have should have like a login here for you for the ITC to use when you're submitting for your district. I got to think of the username. This is what it looks like when you come in the home, the districts. This is the one that we're going to be looking at. But some of these I'll summarize but I just wanted to give you a live look at what it looks like because some of my screenshots are small, but so basically we're going to, you're, you're going to be in here and it's these three menus. This is where you would um, add a new item to put on the grid. This is where you would merge. And these are last year's, but this is your results. So let me, Go back to the PowerPoint and here's that menu. And the first two, I wanted to show you users menu. And this is the, you can add, view or edit the ITC users or update user passwords under that menu option, unlock or lock users, as well as assign those two role, roles. Um, and that would be done under the user menu. Under the monitor menu, that's what displays the authentication events when the user logs in and out and or changes the passwords if you wanted to um, look at that or you could export it to the C CSV spreadsheet if you needed to. The organization menu, this must be set up to merge data. It includes the ITC name, the address, their federal tax ID number, as well as the state. Oops. The ITC would enter the ODJS number. And then this is, remember those side-by-side -side configuration in USAS where the menu options were different because the district entered their submission details. This is where the ITC would enter those um, details because you're combining the files into one and adding the submission date details to this. So the configuration, if you need to check mark that approved for combined federal and state filing program, you would check mark that. And then Same, I just included the W2 submitter configuration as well. So on this big menu, the districts would be next. Oops. So under the district menu, this is where you would add the districts by single entry. And I think I showed you that new button. You'd click on the new button to um, add a new menu or add a new district you can add it by clicking on that new item and doing a single entry 
or you can mass import. And in the manual, like we always provide, there's that template oops, spreadsheet that is already pre-formatted so that you could take it and upload the CSV file into your mass load district option. This is where you would click on new item and this is where you would manly, manually enter. So the school's IRN for Cotton Schools, their phone number, their USAS URL, and their USPS URL. Um, and then they would click save and then that district would be saved on that menu option. Let me go into that. So here's that new item that you could um, enter manually and click save. Or here is where you would upload. And then eventually, that's where your districts would show on this tab. So that first grid is a grid of all the uploaded TAP files that you, that you uploaded for each district that you're submitting on behalf of. So you would, like I said, click on the new item and upload the file. If you need to edit the existing record, there's that icon to edit. And if you want to review the actual file and the contents of the file, there's a download button on the menu that you can also do that. So then the next tab, 1099 merge, this is where you merge all that all the districts entered under this tab, this tab merges them all into one. And then the results would show under that tab. And again, this is 2022, but you would have 2023 and the total number of districts. It would display the, the tap files selected in the merge step with the number included. You can, there's a review or edit icon that you could review the number of records, the number of pays and the amounts. And then you take that merged file that's already in the IRS format and click download to save it to your, your computer. And then that file can be uploaded and submitted to the IRS. So we're just using this um, ITC management program to like append all the files together. And then you'll use that file to submit to the IRS on behalf of the districts. Any questions? I did wanna show you that calendar year end page again. where the agenda is and all the resources. I also wanted to point out that these checklists are also included in the manual. So when you're in the application and you go to the documentation, it's a found under the appendix. There's a chapter in the appendix that says um, checklists. right here. And it's the same calendar year checklist that is on that calendar year end page. So this is, again, a general checklist that we kind of went through. I just showed you more screenshots and examples. But if you have any questions, please submit a ticket or let us know and we'd be happy to help. I also wanted to show you Here's our next coming Fridays with Fiscal. And again, like she mentioned, the review of 
the 109 or W2 printing, submitting, and archiving. And then December 1st is a recap of November releases. December 8th, USPS will provide the Medicare pickup prep for calendar year in prep. And then I mentioned this earlier that uh, the peroration utility will be demonstrated and how you can utilize that on December 15th. And then I believe in January, they're going to have a session on corrections, corrections for the W-2s, corrections for the 1099s, but we didn't want to put all that information in today's because today we're just reviewing and prepping for the forms to be printed and submitted and for the year to be closed. So on that note, if there are no questions, I'll let you go. I appreciate you all attending and have a good weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.